coming up on this episode of Photography Online. We look at some unique and novel tripods, we journey to what feels like the edge of the world, and we show you how to make arty and fun prints with UV light. Welcome to part two of this month's Photography Online, which is brought to you by Squarespace, the perfect all-in-one platform for creating great looking websites and stores. More on that in a little bit. Once again, we are bringing you the show from the Glengarry Castle Hotel, situated in the heart of the Great Glen here in the Scottish Highlands. I'll be telling you a little bit more about this place soon, but before that, we thought we would take you on a rather special journey. A few months ago, Marcus ventured to what he describes as the most inaccessible place in the UK in order to try and get one of the shots on his wish list ticked off. Not wanting to miss out, I asked him to film his adventure so that we could all see just how special this place is. It's 6am on a calm but cloudy July day and I'm heading to one of my favourite places in the whole world. This is no ordinary place though as it's about as remote as places can get. More on that in a moment. I'm lucky in that I'm already based on the Isle of Skye, which many see as being remote in itself. But Skye is positively metropolitan compared to where I'm going. If you're based elsewhere in the UK, or even in the world, then getting to Skye can be an adventure in itself. Once on Skye, you'll need to board this boat, which during the summer months makes regular trips to the UK's most isolated archipelago, St Kilda. On a good day, it's a four hour journey, but this can be longer if the seas are rough, which they often are. The journey, however, offers lots to see for the first hour or so, as the boat threads its way through the Outer Hebrides and out into the untamed North Atlantic. I'm lucky today, as there's not much of a swell, and the journey will be comfortable. But this is a journey I've made many times and I've got a few stories to tell about the other times when things weren't so calm. Hour two sees all land disappear from sight and hour three is where you start to get a realization for how remote St Kilda actually is. It's not usually until hour four when the first sight of the UK's only double world heritage site comes into view. A mighty extinct volcano piercing the wild Atlantic Ocean. At first, it's difficult to get a sense of scale, but eventually, as you near the first of the islands, the enormity of the place becomes apparent. Home to the UK's tallest sea cliffs, largest sea stacks, and some of Europe's biggest bird colonies, St Kilda is world class from any perspective, not least for photography. The purpose of my trip is to try to bag a shot which only has potential to work for a couple of weeks per year, and one which has evaded me for the past seven years. St Kilda is one of our annual locations where we run photography holidays, so I've been here many times. Each year I attempt to capture what I believe to be the best view in the UK, and certainly one of the best in the world, but it's not easy. I've got the shot on numerous occasions, but I don't have it as I want it, and this is the problem. The shot I want only has the potential to work around the end of June or beginning of July, as the sun needs to be rising in the northeast. The 
The shot itself isn't very ambitious, but the remoteness of the location makes it ambitious. It only gives me one chance per year to get the shot, and I have to commit to the journey well before I have access to any weather forecast. It's basically a big game of roulette, and I get one spin of the wheel each year. After four hours at sea, I've made it to St Kilda. But this is where the real adventure starts. You see, the location I need to be at is right on the opposite corner of the island, and the only way to get there is on foot. It's a two mile very hard trek, carrying a heavy pack and camera gear, food and water. The first half a mile is done on the military road, but I soon need to leave this and start heading towards the most remote corner of the UK's most remote island. If you make it this far, to make the journey a little bit more adventurous, the local skewers do their best to make sure you're not enjoying yourself too much. The views out to the island of Bororay are breathtaking, and you suddenly start to feel like you're a long way from home. It certainly doesn't feel like the UK. So I'm just having a well-deserved break. I've probably got another 20 minutes to go before I reach my location. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about where I'm going. Um, I have a list of ambitious shots that I've been trying to get for many years. And this is one of the ones on my list. However, this shouldn't actually be that difficult to get because it doesn't rely on tides or anything like that. It just relies on light. So I'm only looking for one variable. And if this was easy to access, then I would have got it many times over. However, that's the key. This isn't easy to access. It's one of the most difficult places in the world to get to. And so that's the reason why I've been trying to get this shot for five years, because normally I only get one chance every year to get the shot. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this will be the time. Now, if you watched my previous adventure where I trekked deep into the mountains and camped overnight, I said that it would be the only time I ever did a what's in my bag feature. However, I lied. Hit it. What's in the bag? What's in the bag? In the bag. Yeah! Now, obviously I'm trying to travel as light as possible here. Um, so everything in here is absolutely essential. So we have 5DSR with a 12 to 24 millimeter lens. And that's the one that I need to take the key shot. So uh, I've also got 70 to 200 millimeter lens. Um, and the reason for this is that it's going to require quite a bit of waiting around up here. And there's lots of puffins and other seabirds in the area. So while I'm waiting, I can use this to try and get some nice seabird shots. Um, I've also got a, a 1.4 teleconverter just in case the 70 to 200 isn't long enough. Then I've got that, it's nice and light anyway, so it's not really weighing me down. It doesn't matter if I don't use it. Um, I have a uh, Canon EOS R6 as well. Um, so that's mostly to do video. And again, the video will be of the Seabirds. I've got an adapter so that I can put those lenses onto this camera if I need to. And that's pretty much it. I've also got shotgun mic because when I'm doing video, I might want to try and record the audio of the birds as well. Um, pair of headphones so I can listen to what um, I'm recording and uh, audio recorder. And lastly, but not least, although it's not technically in the bag, let's not leave it out, the trusty King Joy tripod, which is just as essential as anything in here. So didn't want to leave it out. As I near my destination, the local puffing colony are in full breeding mode, constantly bringing in fresh catches of fish for their young. I could sit here and watch these charismatic birds all day, but I have to remember I'm here to get a specific shot. So it's time to check out the viewpoint and remind myself of exactly what it is I need to do.
welcome to the edge of the world. Now, I'm not a flat earther or anything like that, so don't worry, but if there was an edge to the world, then this is how I would hope it looks like. This is the island of Soe. Um, the island I'm standing on is called Herta, and these are just two little dots in the North Atlantic. And as you've seen, it takes quite a lot of effort to get here, but hopefully you'll appreciate this is a very special scene and it's worth the effort. So let me tell you what I'm doing here. Um, obviously, scene speaks for itself, but I've got a cliff behind me on the right hand side, which you can see there. And I've got the same similar cliff on the left hand side, which is behind the camera that you're looking at. And that's way too wide um, to get in a single shot. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a multi-frame panorama starting from about there, once you're out of the way of course. Um, and I'm going to spin around taking multiple shots like this to give me all the frames that I need and then I'll stitch them all together to make one big panorama. Uh, so I'm going to do that in a minute and then I'll also do the traditional single wide angle shot but it does need to be very wide. At the moment, I'm at 12 millimeters. Uh, this is full frame as well, so that's really quite wide, but we've got a beautiful cloud just forming here. So let me, let me just grab that. Now the technical challenge I've got here with this scene is that there's a lot of seabirds flying around, both up in the sky and down there in front of the water. So that dictates the exposure time that I can use. Because if I choose anything between one second and about 500th of a second, then those birds will be recorded as a blur because obviously they're moving quite fast. So if I go faster than one 500th of a second, then they'll be frozen and they'll look exactly like they look to the eye, which in an ideal situation is what I would want. However, there's no way I can get faster than one five hundredth of a second because I'm shooting at f11 because I need I've got the foreground in here so I need that depth of field um, and that's giving me one second so I'm not going to do the math on that um, but to shoot at one five hundredth of a second um, I would need to go to well I can do the math uh, ISO 50,000 um, which I'm not going to do for obvious reasons um, so I have to go the other way and go longer than one second because if we go longer than one second the exposure time is long enough that the birds don't register in the shot um, so ideally I'd like them in the shot because they're a key part of the scene and they tell the story they add atmosphere um, but it's just not possible so sorry guys but you're not going to be in my shot Despite my best efforts, the shots eluded me again, although this was closer than I've ever got before. The sky was good, but the light wasn't as intense as I ideally want it, so this shot will remain on my board of ambition for at least another year. It's far from a wasted journey though. I set off knowing that the odds are always against me, so there's no sense of disappointment or failure. This is all about enjoying an adventure to a very special place, which only a handful of people each year make it to. Getting the shot, whenever that happens, will simply be a well-deserved bonus. We really hope to be able to bring you some amazing overseas locations next year, so make sure that you're subscribed to our channel and activate notifications so that you get a gentle nudge every time we release a new show. Okay, so if you were watching part one of this month's show, you'll have seen us explain all about Infinity Focus and how it can help your photography. We saw Harry getting rather wet and Marcus took some indoor portraits in preparation for some alternative printing using UV light, which you'll see the results of later on in this show. So as I mentioned, this is the Glengarry Castle Hotel, which is one of those places which is a little under the radar, which is why we thought we'd share it with you. Just up there, 
is Loch Ness, which we featured on the show last month. And not far over that way is the Glenfinnan Viaduct, which we featured a couple of times as well. So it really is a great place to base yourself if you're planning on visiting the Highlands to do some photography. On top of that, the hotel itself has an authentic Highland atmosphere. The food is great and the rates are really reasonable. I'll put a link to the hotel in the usual place so you can check it out for yourself. So speaking of getting away to do some photography, let me tell you about Squarespace who are sponsoring this month's show. You can choose from an abundance of beautiful website templates that put your images front and center. After you've chosen a template, you can completely customize your gallery design and even add password protected pages if you want to share private projects with any clients. And the best thing in my view is that you don't need to consider yourself a techie to get a beautiful site up and running in no time at all. You can even choose to include a blog or add a store to sell your work. And the support is 24 seven, just in case you do have any questions. So why not head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready, go to the link in the description and enter code photography online to save 10% off your first purchase. Okay, so a few shows back, we did a feature all about how to use a tripod properly who knew that could be so detailed this proved really popular with you our loyal photography online viewers so we thought we'd show you a couple of different tripods which are designed to do specific jobs tripods don't evolve that much not in the same way that cameras or lenses do but every now and again something new with three legs does come along this happened recently when the clever designers at Kingjoy worked out how to make carbon fibre with a camouflage print. Knowing I like to do the odd bit of wildlife here and there, they sent me one to try out. The only problem is, I can never find the damn thing. Ah. You might not think it's that important to camouflage something that's black, but when you're two metres from an otter, believe me, the less visible you are, the better. As well as the ingenious camouflage design, they've also made this much lighter by reducing the materials in areas where they're not needed for strength and stability. Easily sturdy enough to sport even the heaviest of cameras with the longest of lenses, this thing weighs far less than you'd expect it to, coming in at only 2.4 kilograms. Not bad when it will easily support me. With spiked feet to ensure maximum contact with the ground, it also has a handy leg warmer to prevent heat being wicked from your hands in the winter. The maximum height of the tripod and this head is 173 centimetres. Now that's well plenty enough for me, but that's probably not saying very much. It has no centre column in order to keep the weight to a minimum, but it does come with a handy self-leveling bowl, which makes getting things nice and straight an absolute doddle. For example, this fluid video head, also from Kingjoy, needs to be perfectly level, as I often pan when I'm filming wildlife. Without the self-leveling head, it means I'd have to get the legs of the tripod exactly level. Otherwise, as I pan, my horizon would go all funky, and no one wants that. Priced at £550, these will soon be available to order through the MC2 Photography Store. So, get in touch if you would like one of the first ones when they arrive. The only trouble is you'll need at least three or four of them, as you'll never be able to remember where on earth you put the last one. Now, where did I, where did I put it? Tripod. Oh. Whilst Harry looks for his tripod, let me tell you about a new one which I have. This is my tripod, which I've had for four years now. It's my trusty Kingjoy A86. Now it's built like a tank and it can pretty much handle anything that you or the elements can throw at it. However, there is one minor limitation and that's the maximum height. Now, recently I've been trying to get a couple of shots where the camera has been required to be at least two meters above the ground to get the right viewpoint. Now this just won't go that high. So I've been a little bit stuck. But I mean, you need a step ladder and a very tall tripod. So here you go, uh, beautiful light on the rock. Let's just, it'll need to be about eight foot in the air. But how do we get it up that high? That's the question. The solution to that problem, as well as a couple of others I was having similar issues with, was to tell King Joy of my dilemma. And they came up with the answer by custom building me this thing, 
which I call the Goliath. Now, one thing I specified was that I wanted this to be as sturdy as possible. So I said that I wanted the thinnest leg sections down here to be no thinner than the medium leg sections on my A86. Now, that means that we've got some serious girth going on up the top here, but the result is that this tripod will now support any camera, no matter how big, at a height of two meters above the ground. Admittedly, this isn't the lightest tripod in the world, and you certainly wouldn't want to be carrying this up any mountains, but Goliath and featherweight don't go together. And what's the point of worrying about weight when you need to carry a stepladder to look through the viewfinder anyway? Now the centre column is detachable, but I've decided to keep this one on just to give myself a little bit of extra height. Now another good thing about this tripod is that no matter how big the camera you're using, it never looks top heavy, meaning that you can go really big and get maximum stability. It's also great for supporting video gear, such as this slider, without allowing any bowing as the weight of the camera is shifted from side to side. Now if you're looking at this thinking, wow, I'd love me one of those, then the good news is, is that it can be done. The bad news is that it's not cheap. Although compared to the Gitzo equivalent, at only 950 pounds, it's an absolute bargain. And trust me, this is much better made. So just get in touch if you'd like one. You haven't seen my tripod around, have you? Uh, what does it look like? Well, three legs, pyramid shaped, tripod head. Nah, sorry, it doesn't ring a bell. For sake. If you'd like more information on those tripods or any of the others you see us using in the show, there's a link in the usual place. Now, as you can see, I've come inside to warm up by the fire with a scone and a nice cup of tea. So as many of you know, you can become a Photography Online channel supporter, which helps us make better content for you. We try to reward our supporters with a few extra bonus features and access to exclusive content. But with Christmas coming up and with many of you having supported us for almost a year now, we wanted to show our appreciation by offering you 20% off all Photography Online branded products in our shop. So that includes the t-shirts, the beanies, lens cloths, and our Essential Camera Skills book. The offer is available until the end of the year, so to take advantage of it, simply head to the Community tab and check out the discount code that we posted recently. If you're interested in joining our hundreds of supporters and helping us to keep this show commercial free, simply press the Join button if you're watching on a computer or a mobile device, or go to the link below if you can't find the button. We're currently in talk with a well-respected camera brand to bring our supporters a new monthly show, something we're very excited about. So now is a fantastic time to jump on board. Okay, well, it is time to find out all about the printing process which Marcus took his portraits for in our last show. In our previous show, you would have seen me taking this series of 12 portraits in preparation for doing what's known as a cyanotype print, where we lay the negative onto the paper, expose it to UV light, and we end up with a positive photo. Now, before we go any further, we'd just like to say hands up, I am no expert in this field. I've only been doing this for a couple of days, experimenting with different techniques, trying to get the best results I can. So this is by no means a masterclass and there'll be people out there that know a lot more about this than I do. However, it's a lot of fun and it's essentially pretty cheap and easy to do yourself at home. So I thought I would share with you what I've learned so that you can hopefully give it a go yourself. So before we go any further, let me show you what you're going to need. Of course, you're going to need a negative. Now your negative has to be exactly the same size as your print. So you can't do this with 35 millimeter because you're gonna end up with a print that big. So the reason I've done 12 here is because one of these on its own wouldn't be very big. So we've done a series of 12 and that's going to give us a nice big print that we can then frame and put on the wall. Second thing you're going to need is a piece of paper to print on. Those two are obviously essential. Third thing you're going to need is the chemicals. Now cyanotypes you just end up with part A and part B and when you mix them together, it's very easy to do in equal amounts. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. These are not expensive. Um, there's lots of different processes with, this is known as alternative printing, um, and there's lots of different processes you can do. Um, the reason why I got interested in the first place was there's another one called platinum and palladium printing, where 
the chemicals are going to cost several hundred pounds and they're going to be much smaller bottles than this. So I didn't really want to be making mistakes with very expensive chemicals. So this is cheap. Um, you can make all the mistakes you want with this. It's no big deal. Um, but the process is pretty much the same. You're going to need a brush because we're going to have to mix the chemicals. You need something to mix the chemicals in, just a bowl will do. Um, and you're going to need something to measure the amount of chemicals because it needs to be equal parts. You need to be reasonably accurate with that. Two more things you're going to need. And these are rather unusual. First is a, a printing frame. Um, I'll show you how that works in a minute. It's not just a picture frame. And the last thing you're going to need is a UV box, which I have made myself here. And I'm going to show you how to do that a little bit later on when we're cooking the photo because we'll have a little bit of time to do that. So let's get stuck straight into the good stuff and uh, we'll start mixing the chemicals. part B. So once we've got those in the bowl, we we'll just mix it around and get the brush nicely saturated with the solution. Now, before we paint that onto our paper, we need to roughly mark the edges of where our negative comes to. So I'm just going to get a pencil and gently mark four little dots roughly where the edges are. You won't see these once the print's finished. And what that does is it just shows us where the area that we need to cover with the chemicals. So this is the fun bit. However, I originally thought that it was just going to be a case of sloshing the chemicals on. But in the experiments that I've been doing over the last couple of days there is it's quite important to get the right technique here so doing some research and my own uh, experimentation what I do is I go backwards and forwards left to right several times making sure I've covered the entire area okay, and then once I'm happy about that I then go up and down over the same area. Not putting too much pressure on the brush and just letting the brush do the work. Now I'm going to go diagonally. Okay and then finally I'm going to go backwards and forwards again. Okay, so now I've got all of that done, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go a little bit over the edges, just very lightly, because that's going to give me a nice effect in the borders. And that's one of the appeals in this type of printing, is that you can get kind of funky borders going on. It makes it look a, a little bit more arty. So, now we've done that, what we need to do is let it dry, because obviously we don't want to lay out negative on a wet piece of paper because that's not going to be very good to our negative. So the important thing is that this is now light sensitive but it's only light sensitive to UV light. So I'm doing this at night time when there's no daylight coming through the windows. I can do this under normal lights because normal lights don't emit any UV light. So I can leave this here to dry and it's going to be perfectly okay. But just as a good practice what I do is I normally leave it inside the, uh, the light box with it turned off of course. Okay so while that's drying let me show you what the printing frame is. So basically it's like a picture frame, a piece of glass, but it's got a removable back which you can put pressure on so and it opens like that in half. So what we're going to do is we're going to place the paper on here with the negatives on top and then we invert that onto the glass and then what this does is clamps it down and then we're going to tighten these up and it puts pressure onto the negative because if the negative's even slightly away from the paper then we're not going to get a sharp image so we need that negative being pushed into that paper so no light 
I can get round the side of all the dense bits. Let's just check to see how we're doing on the drying front. Uh, looks pretty good. Okay, so let's get going with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay the negatives onto the paper, making sure that I've got them in the right order. Now it's simply a case of putting the frame together, making sure the negatives don't move in the process. flat. So we're all ready to go. All we need to do now is expose that to UV light for the correct amount of time. So the good thing about this is unlike a conventional photo we can actually see it developing as it happens. So we can keep on checking it just like you check your chicken when you put it in the oven. You keep pulling it out to see if it's done and if it's not you just put it in for extra time. So what we're looking for is these kind of yellowy greeny areas to go a grey and kind of lose all their colour. And once they do that, then it's going to be ready. So we'll pop it in now. Like that. Close the door and turn on the lights. Okay, so it's been 35 minutes now. I'm just going to check it to see how it's doing. Okay, so you can see that we've still got quite a bit of colour going on around the outside. It is getting greyer, but it's way too green and yellowy, so that's going to go back in again for quite a bit longer. While we wait for the print to expose, let me quickly show you how this UV box was made. It's simply a case of constructing a box to the right size, remembering to put a door on the front. We lined ours with black velvet to prevent the light from bouncing around and reducing the sharpness of the print. We then fixed four rolls of UV LED lights to the top, connecting them in pairs so that we only had two switches rather than four. Then it was done. Total cost was less than £100. You can get higher powered UV strip lights which will result in faster exposure times but these low powered lights will be fine for anyone not in a hurry. If you don't want to make your own UV box you can simply use the sun but this isn't much use over the winter months here in Scotland so a box is the way to go. Okay, after 70 minutes in the oven it's time to check the exposure. Okay, this is much better now. I don't know if you can see that but uh, we've lost a lot of the colour and the borders have gone grey so I reckon that that's pretty good. So now for the exciting part, we need to get this out and this is our print. So there we have it. So you can see that the highlights are still very green and yellowy and the shadows are very gray. Now, hopefully what's gonna happen is we're now gonna wash this in water and all the yellow will come out of the paper therefore leaving highlights and all the um, the greys will go deep blue um, and then we'll end up with a, what's known as a cyanotype print which is basically a, a monochrome print but instead of black and white it's blue and white. After a couple of minutes the yellows disappear and the shadows become blue. These blue areas will darken as they oxidize over the coming days but it's possible to speed up this process by adding a small amount of hydrogen peroxide to the wash bath. It's then simply a case of gently agitating the print for a couple of minutes before washing for a final time in clean water and then hanging to dry. So there we have it, our cyanotype print. We just need to wait for this to dry overnight. So I'm going to hang it up and then we can frame it. And as you can appreciate, that's a unique piece of art. So every time we do this, it will be slightly different. We'll have different borders and or get different density, maybe a slightly different exposure, but I'm reasonably happy with this because we've got nice deep shadows, we haven't lost any detail in the highlights, um, so we've got a good tonal range there, and all in all, I'm pretty happy with that. Cyanotypes are fun and easy to do at home, and are a great way of getting kids enthusiastic about photography. 
as they can get hands-on and produce a finished piece of art without having the need for a darkroom. My personal winter project is to move on to platinum and palladium prints, so I'll be sure to invite you along on the journey. Let us know if you'd like to see more features on printing as it's a topic that we've not covered before and with all the various options available, it can be a daunting area of photography to delve into. Okay, so we are out of time again, but we're back in just a couple of weeks and we'll be back on home turf on the Isle of Skye with another action-packed show. We'll be telling you all you need to know about shooting amazing seascape photos. We'll be going behind the scenes at the judging process for one of the UK's biggest photo competitions and we'll be taking you along on the big workshop, our most popular annual event so please join me for that don't forget to hit the like button if you've enjoyed the show and appreciate the work that all the team put into bringing you the show twice a month please feel free as well to leave us any comments or questions we really do enjoy interacting with everyone in fact we might do another q a session in the next couple of shows so send us anything that you want to know and we might feature that soon okay well the music is about to end and my limo is waiting so until next time take good care but most of all take good photos